Hello everyone and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Lyndall Stout. We'll dive right in to winter crop planting and cover crops this week. Here's Sun Up's Dave Deacon and our Extension Cropping System Specialist, Josh Lofton. Over the past week, we've had some moisture across Oklahoma and Josh, that, that can impact the planting of canola. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and for the positive for the most part. Um, we, we are looking out behind us and we are having quite a bit of rainfall in particular areas. Most of the canola area that we still expect to see some acres in canola here in the state um, have received some, some really nice rainfalls over the last couple weeks. And the biggest thing to remember about canola as, as opposed to things like wheat and maybe some of uh, the other things we'll plant this winter is how shallow we have to plant it and how good we have to have it uh, for that canola to, to come out of the ground really fast and really timely. And so a, a conditions like we have behind us to where it's a little wet and it's a little soggy, uh, this is kind of not what we want um, either before or right after. Here in a couple of days, if, if we don't get any more rain, this is this is the kind of seed bed where we expect to, to see good things coming out of your canola. But with the good rainfall, we, we talked a couple weeks ago that how dry we were, we were going to need this rain. We got it. So we're, we're setting ourselves up nicely for some of this uh, winter crop planting here. Some of the conditions and some of the, the issues we have with it being so warm, it's okay if we stretch back into maybe that first week of October. It, it's still pretty good. For insurance windows, we're still looking at that October 10th. We still have good potential a little bit after that if they're not going to be insured, but that, that October 10th is, is traditionally a really good time to stop planting canola. Always can find one of those uh, good years and those couple of fields that do really well after it. But if you're planting canola, as long as you have good rain, maybe not a heavy three inch downpour in the future, it's, it's good to get it in with this good moisture we have right now. And when it comes to canola production, we have to remember that it, it's in the field to help clean up a wheat crop as, as part of a cropping system, but also there's other options as we move through the winter too. Yeah, that's one good thing to continue to talk about canolas is uh, we talk about all these other things that, that crops besides wheat can bring in. And we, we have a lot of folks kind of guessing around what they're gonna do this year. The wheat price is not great um, and, and they're, they're looking for something to move out. Uh, canola is still a really good option. We talk about all those benefits that it has, the, the weed, uh, the breaking the weed cycles and the disease cycle, the insects, bringing in herbicides that we traditionally can't go into to true wheat ground. When we start talking about cover crops and planting, especially if we're gonna have cattle out on the field, we wanna make sure to get it out as soon as possible because we want that good growth to it. We can't wait and delay. Um, sure, cover crops planted later will do just fine. We, we've seen them planted all the way through December do just fine as far as the spring growth. You won't get any winter growth and we're still wanting to protect that soil, add all those benefits in starting in the fall. This is a good time for, for producers looking at canola or producers looking at cover crops to really get a lot in, take advantage of this good soil moisture we have out there and get some of these other alternative winter crops or winter systems in right now. Talk about why it's important for producers to, to look at their overall cropping system and, and not be reactionary towards I, yeah, if toward, toward, towards what's happening right now, but to take a bigger picture overall of their field. That has to be a decision mechanism that we have. Adding in that diversity always helps us on the back end. If we can make it through this year and gain that financial support in future years and still being able to keep our head above ground this year, um, it's, it's really good to add in that diversity. And we have, especially with as much cover crop options as we have right now, especially if you have a herd of cattle that you're looking to feed something for and you can bring in that cash flow during the season, we have good options to bring in some very diverse mixtures or just diverse cover crops here that, that can be quite successful, have been proven to be quite successful for, for future seasons. So we're talking about some of our small grain mixes. We're talking about some of our things like uh, the turnips and radishes. Bring in the same things that canola does, uh, but, but it's just something a little bit different. So you have some of that legume, grassy cover crop uh, mixture into something here. Great, great feed for cattle over that wintering time and really can add some diversity to your wheat system. And this is a great opportunity for producers to go to their county office and talk to the county educators to kind of learn 
what options there are in their specific county. Yeah, and that's exactly right. Talk to your county educator, to your state specialist, to some of the seed dealers to find out what your options are because that's going to that's going to pay off better in the end whenever you go go to actually go put these things in the ground is is getting everything laid out before you and picking the best option that you have available because that's really what we want to do in these real tough economic times is look at all the options we have and go with with what works best for our system. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Josh Lofton, Cropping Systems Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And we have information of an upcoming field day at the Eastern Oklahoma Research Station near Haskell. This will be an opportunity for producers to learn about Oklahoma State University research and to stalker cattle production, some of the new technologies to help them manage cattle, and information about the value added cattle sales across the state. They will also be looking at different varieties of Bermuda grass and how to manage them in the area. The Eastern Research Station field day will be from 9.30 to noon on October 8th at the station just south of Haskell. For more information about the field day, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. We're joined now by Amanda de Oliveira Silva, our new Extension Small Grain Specialist. Amanda, welcome to campus. Thank you. And it's not your first time to be at Oklahoma State University. No, it's not. So as a matter of fact, I am originally from Brazil. I earned my bachelor's degree there. And uh, during my bachelor's, I had to do an internship somewhere. And so my first time in the US was here doing an internship at Oklahoma State. Uh, where I came here to work with the cropping systems group, mainly worked with corn production and nitrogen management. And I, uh, afterwards, I went to Kansas, where I earned my PhD. I worked with wheat production, so had some experience with the wheat variety trial. So now I'm here. Great. Well, this is an exciting time of year. It's planting time. We're starting to see the baby wheat around the field. So let's just dive right in with an update on how things are going around Oklahoma. Yeah, so um, we have had some good moistures in, uh, in the soil in the past week and some producers took advantage of that and um, there are some wheat on the ground already and as a matter of fact this is our wheat variety trials here that we planted last week, uh, forage trials and we also had our forage trials in Chickasha. And so in the southwest Oklahoma we did not get as much rain but um, we should have a very good opportunity to, to continue planting in this next couple of days. So I should be there uh, planting in the panhandle tomorrow and, and really get things rolling, it yes. sounds like. Let's talk about some producers are actually grazing volunteer wheat. Explain kind of what is what the situation is and, and kind of some things to, to keep in mind. Uh, so because of the low wheat prices and uh, as we are all aware some producers are considering grazing that volunteer wheat we have been uh, seeing a lot of fields with uh, that green carpet of wheat and things to consider is that uh, leaving the wheat on the ground for grazing will not control the population of wheat crow mites and those mites are, uh, can transmit the vir uh, some virus diseases like wheat streak mosaic and the high plains uh, viruses and working as a green bridge for your next wheat crop. So those are just the things that they, they need to keep in mind that grazing will not control the crow mites uh, infestations that might occur for their uh, next wheat crop. Terrific. Well, very nice to meet you again. Welcome to campus and welcome to Oklahoma. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you again soon. Cow-calf producers with spring calving herds may be looking forward to using some uh, winter pasture such as uh, small grain or, or wheat pasture because the prospects look pretty good with the moisture we've had this late summer, early fall to uh, growing some wheat pasture this winter. If we plan to use wheat pasture as uh, the protein and, and energy for 
some adult cows as they go through this winter and into the calving season next February and March. I'd really suggest that we plan ahead and start to put together a mineral program to match uh, that particular situation for those cows. You see what I'm concerned about is the fact that fast, rapidly growing small grain pasture, such as wheat pasture, is notoriously low in the uh, mineral element magnesium and can cause hypomagnesia or what we often call grass tetany right after these cows calve next spring. This is a particular, particular situation that is most likely to occur in older cows. You see their skeletal structure is less capable of mobilizing elements such as magnesium and calcium when they first calve and are producing the greatest amount of milk. And that's when grass tetany is likely to occur. Our best preventative measure for that is to provide a mineral mix throughout the course of most of the winter and into and through the calving season, a mineral that contains magnesium. I would have one mixed, it's about 12 to 15% magnesium, put it out so that those cows get used to consuming that mineral mix at the rate of three to four ounces per head per day. That way we'll be getting enough magnesium into them that really should lower the risk of grass tetany if they uh, get in that situation next spring. If we'll go ahead and do that now and get those cows used to consuming that much mineral, then I think we can really reduce the risk of grass tetany. Mineral nutrition has always been something that's uh, kind of been a black box, uh, confusing for some ranchers. There's some help available. Go to the SUNUP website. That's sunup.okstate.edu. Look under the show links and there you'll find a link to a really excellent bulletin called Vitamin and Mineral Nutrition for Grazing Cattle by Dr. Lawman here at OSU. It does a great job of describing the mineral needs of cattle under different situations, different pastures, and, and different production stages of, of the cattle's life. I think it's one that can really be helpful to you. Download it and read it, and I think you'll find it really helpful as you plan your mineral needs on your herd. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. Talking cotton right now with our extension cotton specialist, Seth Bird. So Seth, uh, how's cotton looking throughout the state right now? Uh, it looks poor to great. Uh, depends on what we're talking about. Uh, a lot of the dry land crop has had a pretty rough go of it the last couple of months. Uh, so uh, there's quite a lot of dry land that's probably getting ready to be harvested. Uh, but there's certainly some low yield potential dry land out there. Uh, irrigated crop looks really good uh, for the most part. We've talked about all year how we've been behind and we're still a little behind. When you start looking at bowl development, you start slicing bowls open and looking at how those bowls are progressing. Uh, but the yield potential is there. Uh, and September has been really good for us. And so hopefully we can get this weather to kind of roll for another one or two weeks. And uh, there's gonna be a lot of cotton that's gonna be having harvest aid supply in the next couple of weeks or in the next month. Um, it's been, you know, pretty hot this, this September. Has, how's that impacted the cotton? It's been, so it's been by and large positive. Um, being that we got a little behind early in May and June, we knew we needed a, a pretty good September to, you know, kind of catch up, make up on some heat units. Last year we see what, what happens when we get a, a cooler, cloudier September. And, you know, besides today, we've had a pretty, you know, warm and sunny September. So that's helped these bowls that, you know, we're sitting in July that may have been a little behind because of the heat units that we started with, kind of catch up. And again, we're not all the way there, but we've made a lot of ground up in the last four to five weeks. Uh, so for the, most of the cotton, especially the irrigated crop, the, the September we've had has been kind of perfect. You couldn't have dialed up a better September. You mentioned harvest, uh, harvest dates earlier. So when we're talking about harvest dates throughout the state, what are we looking at? So, and again, it kind of depends on that yield potential. With dry land, we're looking at trying to get in and out as probably as, as cheaply as we can. And we don't really need to do a whole lot of dry land this year. Um, a lot of it is, is got a lot of those bowls already open. Uh, and we're just trying to remove some leaf or maybe open a little bit of, of bowls. And so that's gonna be a pretty inexpensive, maybe one or two product shot. On the irrigated side, we're gonna need to do a lot of work. We, you know, we've got a lot of bowls that we still need to open. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of good green mature leaves that we need to remove. And that's key for cotton to either have that green leaf removed or at the very least desiccated on the plant before we strip. Uh, for pickers, we certainly wanna see green leaf off the plant. Uh, and then, you know, if we go back to last year, one of our biggest challenges was, was regrowth. And so, Regrowth is something that usually occurs after we've 
hit you know our our fields with that first defoliation pass and we get warm wet weather we can spur some root growth from the top of the plants or from down lower on some lower nodes where that sunlight penetrates and so having a regrowth inhibitor uh, can be key if the forecast looks like we're going to need it. There's going to be some regrowth potential in the next, you know, five to ten days after we apply a harvest aid. And you actually have some fact sheets to kind of help with producers, you know, determine all this, right? We do, yes. Yeah, so we have a harvest aid guide, uh, you know, where we sort of try to update it every year. The 2018 version's out now, 2019's coming. Uh, that kind of does a, a, a sort of an overview of what they're for. Uh, you know, what products work best in which situations. And we have tables of, of the different products that we have out. And then also tables, depending on your yield potential of cotton, maybe what you need to do or what mixes are available. Uh, and then we also have a fact sheet for folks that are gonna be rotating to some sort of a winter cover crop or a winter small grain crop. Um, a lot of our harvest aids in cotton are gonna have some plant back intervals to wheat or rye or barley or different small grains. And so when we choose that, that harvest aid, not only do we need to choose it for what the cotton needs, but we may need to think about what we're doing next. And so we also have a fact sheet out on just considerations for you know, a harvest aid in cotton and how it's gonna impact our, our small grain crop in the winter. All right, thanks Seth. If you would like some more information for a fact sheet on the cotton varieties and a fact sheet on harvesting dates, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, the 2020 wheat crop being planted around Oklahoma right now, but prices continuing to shift around. Give us an idea what's going on. Uh, not much. You know, you look at that Kansas City, our KC December contract, we wanted to break that $4.10 level. It went up and really got up to $4.11, but it backed off six or seven cents earlier in the week. It's back up to around $4.10 now. So our cash prices are just essentially wallowing around. Let's talk about Russia now continuing to kind of impact the market. What's the latest there? Oh, uh, there's a big dilemma there. You look at uh, their prediction for Russia's crop uh, just before the WASD on the, that came out the 12th. Uh, Russia came out with 2.75 billion bushels. Then the USDA came out the next day at 2.66 billion bushels, almost 100 million bushel uh, difference there. About a week later, Russia came out with 2.76 billion bushels. And then this week they came out with 2.87 billion bushels. There's a lot of uncertainty there. Just remember, whatever Russia produces, they're going to put on the export market. What else is kind of happening in the market that we should keep in mind? Well, in the recent weeks, uh, France has uh, underbid uh, Russia to, for uh, some cargoes of wheat into Egypt. Now France is uh, exporting uh, soft red winter wheat uh, compared to Russia's uh, hard red, uh, red wheat. Now, <clears throat> remember that any bushel that uh, Russia doesn't sell, they're going to be selling to somebody else if they don't uh, sell it to Egypt. So. That's, uh, that's some market that uh, is no longer there for us to get. Uh, you look at Argentina, we've been saying it's dry there, the yields are probably declining. A report came out this week that they'll probably have a record crop. Record crop, Argentina again exports what they produce. That's going to you know, c keep our prices relatively low because it's going to increase competition. The only good news will be is that uh, prices, uh, you look around the state, they're up in the 375 to 380 level versus 350 level. Uh, there's some potential that they can get up around $4 or maybe slightly higher as we get into the December time period, but at least prices aren't lower than they are now. Okay, Kim, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. For more on fall armyworms and scouting, here's extension entomologist Tom Royer. Uh, well, traditionally, uh, this year has been what I would consider to be kind of a lighter year for fall armyworms compared to last year. But uh, as, as you can see behind me, as, as wheat is starting to get planted, it's vulnerable to any flights that might come through between now and when we get our first killing freeze. So it's very, I always encourage producers to keep watch of their fields as they're coming out of the ground so that they don't get uh, really hurt early uh, by fall armyworms coming in and, and causing damage. Um, the other thing uh, that uh, anybody that's growing, uh, that has pastures for hay, uh, they need to be out looking at their fields for fall armyworms too because they can come in and start causing problems, that, uh, especially with if, if you have fescue. Fall armyworms seem to prefer that over Bermuda grass even. So uh, producers need to be aware of that because 
A fall army worm population in a fescue field can go from being almost unnoticeable to basically taking out um, the hay. Um, the options that really are available are, uh, there, there's a number of insecticides that are available, uh, but we, we like to base it on scouting. So we have thresholds that we, we set up in place for wheat or pasture. Um, and we uh, talk about different scouting methods. Basically, uh, in wheat, you know, one to two per foot a row is uh, what we're concerned about. We always talk to producers about watching their their uh, their wheat to make sure they're not seeing evidence of uh, feeding damage. That what we call window painting. They're a pod feeder, so this is the time of year when you got soybeans that are uh, that have pods set. They can uh, be out there you know, causing a lot of injury to the pods. They can cause shriveling of the seeds. They can cause, sta they can cause uh, staining of the seeds so that the seed quality is not as good. And uh, we usually uh, recommend use either using a beet um, cloth or a sweep net. And our thresholds typically are, we suggest, are one to two per row foot in soybeans. And we have a lot of products that are available also um, if, if the seeds are developing and the stink bug feeds on them, with their, their, they're just basically piercing the uh, pot and feeding directly on the seed, they can shrivel up the seed, causing, making it almost look like it had drought injury, or if not, they'll stain the seed with their feeding injury, so you'll see these seeds with brown spots and uh, that kind of thing, and so the seed quality itself is is not as good because uh, we've had a good year for growing soybeans. I think that uh, there's a real potential for some yield. Don't let the enemies take it away from you. Whatever is out there, you know, protect it. Hi, Wes Lee with your weekly Mesonet weather report. Recent rains have made a positive impact on drought conditions in Oklahoma. Both the drought-stricken southwest and southeast received several inches as seen in this five-day map from September 25th. The highest totals came from the remnants of tropical storm Amelda dumping 8.66 inches at Clayton. When looking at the soil moisture, we see a good improvement this week at all the places indicated in green. The brown areas show the areas that had drying soils at least at the 10 inch level. If we focus on the 2 inch sensor, we see soil moisture is in good shape for seed germination over most of the wheat belt. The only exception would be the far northwest and the panhandle. You're not alone in wondering where the fall temperatures have been. September has had above average high temperatures as seen in this chart in all but three days. The orange bars are the long-term average and the blue bars are the actual statewide temperatures. Even more dramatic than air temps have been dew points. Dew points are a measurement of moisture in the air. They should be going down this time of year but instead have been going up. They have averaged 4.65 degrees above normal for the month. Here's Gary with the updated drought map and long range forecast. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well we have had some pretty good rains over the last week or two that's helped us in the drought categories a little bit, but unfortunately that uh, summer season has extended all the way through September. What's that done for the latest drought monitor report? Let's take a look. Well drought giveth and drought taketh away. We've had an increase in drought coverage up in the northwestern Oklahoma where we have that moderate drought category now covering more of uh, Ellis and Roger Mills counties up into Woodward and Harper counties and also out into the eastern panhandle. We've seen a reduction in drought intensity and coverage down in far southwest Oklahoma. That extreme drought, the dark red, has retreated back into Texas but we still are left with a little bit of moderate, a little bit of a severe drought down in that area. Now we're going to go out and look at the uh, Climate Prediction Center outlooks for the October through December time frame. For temperature, we see increased odds of above normal temperatures really across the entire country. But for our little neck of the woods, 
we see greatly increased odds out in the far western panhandle, a little bit better increased odds across much of the state, and for northeast Oklahoma, just a little bit of an increased chance of above normal temperatures through that three month time frame. So that's not gonna help the drought situation necessarily, but we'll just have to see what happens there. For precipitation, we see increased odds for above normal precipitation, especially in the Panhandle, but also across basically the northwestern half of the state. For the southwest, southeastern half of the state rather, we see equal chances for above normal, near normal, or below normal precipitation amounts. So that's a little bit of a wash for the state as a whole, but hopefully the northwestern half does see some increased precipitation during that time frame to counteract that increase in temperature that we expect uh, if the temperature outlooks do come, into, uh, uh, do come true. So with that first fall cold front, maybe that does mean the uh, true beginning of autumn. Let's hope so. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.